Come on over here. We got some room. Come on over. Come on. <laughs> Gary Smith, come on over here. <laughs> Y'all, I'll try to talk <clears throat> as fast as I can. I don't usually talk too fast. Uh, I am mean, happy that Deb Sofield appears to have gotten over her shyness <laughs> sometime recently. Um, I love coming up to, to Greenville. Donna, thank you very much for that introduction. Philip and Eileen Kilgore, thank you very much for opening this beautiful place up. We appreciate everybody being here. And uh, I got to tell you one, one little funny story. And some of you may have heard it, but it's a pretty funny story. As you, you know, I was on the way to Cleveland to the Republican convention, and I asked Peggy if she ever in her wildest dream, in her wildest dream, had seen her husband at Republican National Convention nominating Donald Trump for president. She said, Henry, I hate to tell you, I've never seen you in any of my wildest dreams. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are. We are in the greatest state in the whole country. And I can tell you from my time in, in government and being in a position to see what's going on around the country and around the world, as some of these folks here in elected office and some of you here in business have been in a position to look down on the world and see the maze, to see how it all fits together and how it works and how to get from one place to the other. And I can tell you, we've got everything we, re we need right now for enormous prosperity. And enormous prosperity solves all kinds of problems. From criminal domestic violence, it goes down when you have everybody has jobs and they're happy. When people get up and want to go to work, they're happy. They're making money. They can provide for their family. <laughs> Domestic violence goes down. Drug usage, usage goes down. The opioid crisis would subside some, although we got a real tiger by the tail on that one. Marriages go up. Divorces go down. Everything good happens when there's economic prosperity. And based on the work that a lot, some of you here in this, in this yard, in, at this beautiful home, have worked in getting us to where we are now. And so I want to say thank you. Where's Bob Taylor, for example? Bob Taylor. Boy, he's done his part. And I appreciate it. There he is, right there. I remember Bob had a pretty good bit of hair, and what he had was very dark. It wasn't that long ago. But we've got, we have got enormous prosperity coming our way if we don't mess it up. And way, one way we can do that is by imposing more taxes on the people. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, I vetoed that gas tax. That's the biggest tax in the history of South Carolina. It was a 75 increase in the tax on gas. And it is a tax that by my estimation, the information I had was not needed because we had plenty of money coming in if we just spent it all on the roads, which we had not done. And I vetoed it. It got overridden. That's fair enough. That's the way the system works. But I can promise you this, what I'm going to see too, is that those, those dollars that are coming from these people, some of which cannot, there are a lot of people, y'all, that, that don't have the money to pay more for gas. Peggy and I have some student apartments around the university in Columbia. We've had, had carpenters and plumbers say, uh, Ms. McMaster, we can't come to work on your stuff anymore. Why is that? It costs too much gas to get here. We say, well, according to the, to the promotion for the gas tax, you get 25,000, you get 20, 20 miles, 25 miles to the gallon and an average of about 15,000 miles a year in your automobile. He said, and if so, I get about 35,000 miles on my trucks and I get about seven miles to the gallon. And you add it up, it comes up to enough money to be a problem for people. There's no point in putting the burden of something like that on people who are trying to get up on the first or second rung of that ladder. And I'm going to oppose, I will oppose as hard as I can any tax increase of any kind on the people of South Carolina as long as I'm in this position. I can promise you that because we don't need it. We've got plenty of money going in. The way to get more money going in is to reduce taxes, reduce regulations so businesses can grow. What happens? People invest, people work, and you've got more people working, more people paying a little bit of taxes, but you end up with more money. You all remember Jack Kemp? Y'all remember Arthur Laffer? We had him at the mansion not long ago. He's written a book on it again, and it's proven 
how that works. You remember Ronald Reagan? Remember supply side economics? It works. Remember Jack Kennedy? It works. Every time it's tried, it works. But we have a government, especially in Washington, that doesn't believe it, they won't do it, they think the way to get more money is just tax people more and more and more. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not the way. That is the way down, not the way up. So I don't believe in any more taxes on the people of South Carolina, that's for sure. There are a lot of other things we need to do. I, I need to mention the assets that we have. We've been rated once again. Well, now we are the second best state in the country in which to do business. This is our second year in a row. Georgia is first. We are second. I don't remember the other few, but I know it's Tennessee. I know it's, uh, it's Tennessee, it's Texas. Georgia's first and there are two more. They had the first six and they, I quit reading after that. But the point is, guess what they all have in common? They are all in the sunny south. That's where everything is coming and there are a whole lot of reasons. And I'll tell you why they're coming to South Carolina and the reason I know this it's because the last few years I've had the opportunity to speak to these big businesses from around the world that are coming to South Carolina to look. Very often, we don't realize how good we have it. We just, we live here. Everybody's always friendly, aren't they? We look people in the eye, we shake their hand, we say hello to a total stranger walking down the street. We hug each other all the time. They don't do that every place. People are not like that, not even all over the United States. But Peggy, I, I, was, uh, I was telling Peggy, I went out to a, a shelter during the hurricane and there was a family that had come down. They were not uh, running from the hurricane. They were, they were moving from Virginia to go to Georgia. Truck broke down in the middle of the hurricane, traffic all over the place. Had to leave the truck out there. They came to the shelter at Dent Middle School just outside of Forest Acres in Columbia. And we were talking to him. Were, the son, the oldest son was not there. He was getting ready to finish basic training at the Marines. They had two other boys there. And this man and woman were telling us, they said, people have been so nice to us here. We're not going to go to Georgia. We're going to stop right here and live in Columbia. South Carolina is a different place. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people say that. What else do these people from other countries see? They see we have three major research universities that work together in partnerships with businesses. Witness ICAR, witness the aeronautical engineering at the University of South Carolina. Take a look at Siemens that just gave $624 million worth of top state-of-the-art uh, architectural and engineering um, software to the University of South Carolina. IBM, National Data Analytics Headquarters is in Columbia. It just goes on. These other universities don't do this. We have three major research universities. They all do it. That's different. What else do we have? Write this down. We have the best. We have the best technical college system in the whole world. A lot of these countries don't have colleges, of course. But we have colleges. This is higher education. It is sophisticated. It is productive. And it has changed. Started in 1961, and it has gotten stronger and stronger. With Ready SC and our apprenticeship programs, these companies from all over the world come and they say, we've never seen anything like, we have people who will go from our technical colleges who will go to Japan or China or England or anywhere else and look at the plants over there that are interested in coming here. They'll go look at them and see how the machinery works, see what the customs are, see how they do things, see what the traditions are, as well as how the robots work and how the machinery, these machines cost millions of dollars. They'll come over here, put it in the curriculum in one of our technical college and bring in students through that network who will learn how to run those machines before the company gets here. You know who else does that in the United States? Nobody. Now, if they start now, maybe they'll get to where we are in 20 or 30 or 40, 50 years. But we started in 1961. You can't beat that. What else do we have? We've got a port. The port of Charleston is magnificent. It's getting ready to get deeper. We ran into a, a little snag and we had to go to work. I was uh, honored on your behalf to go to the White House and talk to people there to tell them I had to put some money in the Court of Engineers budget. Because if we could get just one dollar our legislators know how that works. If we can get just one dollar in that Corps of Engineers budget to go along with the 300 million that's already been put in the budget by our far-thinking legislature, just one dollar, we could expand it to more later, which we're already doing. Well, we got that in there. Entire congressional delegation was working on that. 
we got that line item in there, we've got a few dollars in, it's going to develop into more and we'll be able to, we're going to start dredging the Port of Charleston to take it to 55 feet at low tide, which means day and night those big new ships that can carry 13, 14, thousand of those container units can come in 24 hours a day two at a time in charleston we will be the biggest most productive port on the atlantic coast with new york new jersey does anybody know how to spell port it's m-o-n-e-y that's how you spell port and not only that we are the only state to have a sure enough high quality long distance inland port run from the, from the port of charleston Norfolk Southern Railway up to cross 85 through Greer and on to the rest of the country. And we're getting ready to open one in Dillon, in the city of Dillon, that'll be CSX, so you got the competition, running from the Port of Charleston, across that part of the state, through Dillon, through I-95, and on to the rest of the country. No other state has got that. We've got that. We have the lowest union participation in the country. The lowest is 1.6% or something like that. That's because of our right to work law, our right to work attitude. We got plenty of electric power. We're going to expand that. One of my jobs is to see to it that we get into the world of solar power. And I've met in two days, I've met with two major companies that are interested in coming to South Carolina and investing billions of dollars to introduce solar power. We already have some. We've got, we are growing faster than any other state in our use of solar power. These big companies want to come here, they go hire people, and they want to be the, the main supplier of, of solar equipment in the United States. And I'll tell you, it's, it's mighty gratifying to me to be able to talk to these people and hear them say these wonderful things about our people. And one final point on, on that, talking to them and, and negotiating and hearing what their needs are and their ho hopes and dreams. They've all said the same thing, because I've asked them, this is these companies that have been here for a number of years. We've got 160 German companies here. We have 50 Canadian companies in South Carolina. We've got companies all over the place. We've been, in, been discovered by the Far East, everybody. And they're all interested in coming here. I was meeting with a big group today, and I was wondering if some other group was going to jump in the window and come in there while we were having these conversations. But this is what they've said. They said, all of those assets that South Carolina has to offer are wonderful. But the main thing that South Carolina has to offer is the people. They said, the people of South Carolina are different. The chairman of BMW said, and I quote, this was at the 25th anniversary of that plant, which has changed everything in our state, put us on the map, and we're on more on the map now than we were then. We're at the top of everybody's map now. But he said, and I quote, the people of South Carolina are different. We call South Carolina a handshake state. We have never seen another handshake state. I've been all over the world looking for places to put these, to invest in hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. And there's no place like South Carolina. What is a handshake state? If a man or woman of South Carolina looks you in the eye and gives you their word, they will keep it. Said so you're different. You're different. And that's why we're here. And because of that loyalty, that dedication, that resilience, that intelligence, and that willingness to work and learn with our magnificent apprenticeship program, Ready Out SC, the technical colleges, and the collaborations that these companies and those people can have with the universities and the colleges, it puts us in a class by ourselves. All we have to do is show them that we're here and don't mess it up. A few years ago, Christy Todd Whitman, you all remember her, she was in the Bush administration. For that, she was in New Jersey, was the uh, governor of New Jersey for eight years. We were in Columbia in one of the big buildings looking out at the beautiful scenery of the University of South Carolina and the greenery in this gorgeous state house and look over beyond to the broad Saluda and Congaree rivers and the trees. It's just beautiful on a day, a beautiful day. And we've been talking about these assets. And she said, and I quote, yes, you do have it all here in South Carolina. I hope you don't mess it up. <laughs> Well, I'm determined not to mess it up. And one way we do that is by keeping the taxes low, getting them as low as we can, cut them to the bone. Let, let the people keep the money that they make, 
and also get rid of those regulations. I've mentioned solar. One problem we have now is we got a lot of electric power, but we've had, as you know, Scano and Santee Cooper have abandoned or have stopped the work on the two nuclear reactors. Well, uh, I know there were hearings and we're getting answers and we're finding out exactly how the decisions were made. I went to work and uh, explained the law to uh, the board at Santee Cooper and they understood that they needed to release that report that had been written a year and a half earlier but had been kept secret. And so we got it in the morning, released it in the afternoon, and it's a, it, it, was a, it provided important information to people to, to understand the legislative leaders and committees to try to see exactly what happened. But here's what else has happened, and there hadn't been much about this. We are covered up by power companies and in, billionaire individuals who want a piece of South Carolina. They want to buy Santee Cooper, or they want to buy Santee Cooper's interest in those two reactors, or they want to buy all of that, or they, some of them are even talking about buying the whole, the, the, those two reactors. Some want this, some want that. We're, of course, in negotiations and discussions, but what the <coughs> big picture is, these people, again, who are in different parts of the country, are all interested in doing something in South Carolina. So that's more good news, and we're working hard on that, and we'll be working with the legislature, of course, as, as well. Uh, economic development, as I've mentioned, and we have seen, starting, I, I remember Governor McNair had a, the Moody, uh, had a Moody, Moody did a report on South Carolina, what's necessary, that's back in the 60s. And since then, we've had good leadership, and we've grown and grown and grown. Carol Campbell really gave us a, a big boost working to get BMW here, and that has opened a, a whole lot of doors. But I'll tell you, the interest that we've seen just since I've been in office and been involved in has been enormous. We've had 10,000 new jobs announced, three billion, almost $3 billion in capital uh, investment, and that doesn't count the payrolls of these big companies that come and or those that here and expand on 84 projects. And I'll tell you, unless we mess it up, economic prosperity is coming our way, and it's going to make an enormous difference. And I'll tell you, it's about time. I, I think it's time. This is our time, and we need to work hard on it. Just a few other things, and I'll try to answer some questions. There's an opportunity in prison reform. Uh, this is one of the things I was asked to address <clears throat> by Don. Uh, what we're doing about prison reform, and we are, uh, Brian Sterling is the director of the prisons. He has programs for inmates on the way out to learn soft skills, learn how to do things, have a little bit of education so they can get a job. We want to expand that to the Department of Juvenile Justice and all of that to have all these people get a little bit of help on the way out. We think just a little bit of, it doesn't cost us uh, hardly any money at all, but it'll make a big difference. Also, we've had great success with the drug court. The drug court is something where Someone who's a first offender or nonviolent and is not a hardened criminal uh, is arrested and charged. If they plead guilty, they can go to drug court where they go see the judge once a week in the evening. The judges work for free. You have the bailiffs and you have the uh, sheriffs, the deputies there. But they, that, that individual has got to report where he's working during the day, he's going to school, uh, working, uh, uh, going to school during the day and, and working either in the day or the night time. He's got to be there with a tie on uh, in front of the judge every, every time, every week, once a week to give his progress. And if he makes it through and he has to pay for instruction himself, then his uh, sentence will be suspended and he'll put, be put on probation. If he messes up, he goes to jail. I would like to, to increase that, to expand that, not just to the drug criminals, but other younger people who are not hardened criminals and give them an opportunity, an opportunity to, to turn their life around right there. And I'll tell you, it's like going into a church. When you go into a courtroom, you're in a different place. And when there's a judge on the bench and somebody says, all rise, there's Judge Jones or whoever, or Ms. Judge uh, Smith, it makes a difference, and we've seen it work all over the state in, <clears throat> in the drug courts, and it does not cost a thing. 
There are a lot of great ideas. I have learned that the main thing that public office is is the search for a good idea. And so if you've got one, I want it. And we try, we look all over the country to try to find good ideas where we can do better things in South Carolina. I mentioned the harbor. The dredging is going to start in, in October because, as I said, we have got the money. Final thing I guess I'll speak about is, that I'll tell you one thing. As long as I'm governor, I'm going to see to it that there is not a single penny of tax money spent on an abortion anywhere in South Carolina. I just can't help it. That's not the kind of culture we want to promote. It's not how we want to be known. And with all the good things that we have going, that is that is not does not fit with the character, the culture, and the history of South Carolina. Also, <clears throat> I'll say as far as education goes, we've got a lot of work, a lot of things, a lot of opportunities. We've got a lot of people who are working hard with ideas, but I am dedicated to the proposition that charter schools, magnet schools, homeschooling, anything outside of the realm of the regular public schools that we're used to. We've got a lot of good public schools. We don't want to destroy that, but we want to give people an opportunity to do something else. And from my reading, I heard about a, a charter school in some other state that took in 3,000, I think it was 3,000 students, and that's a big school. But to ask, well, how many applications did you have left? They said 23,000. <coughs> uh, people have caught on to the idea that there's more than one way to get a good education. And there are, there are people and there are companies that I have talked to that are interested in starting charter schools. And we had one uh, in, in Goose Creek where a, a, a man, he was a wealthy man, he wrote a check three million dollars to pay for the building and the charter school company which is a for-profit company but not much profit but they are a for-profit private company said that they could easily run the rest of the school just on the per capita money that follows the student wherever they go well they opened up i think they planned on having about 600 students they ended up with i think 671 that's all they could put in and they had about 2,000 applications 2,000 people left over so i think that's a big part of the answer if you've got a, a better idea if you've seen something work better please let me know because i'm we're looking for ideas so that's my story about south carolina that's the story these are things i want to get done uh, i've been I'm so proud of South Carolina, the people of South Carolina. I look at what we've been through since 1670, all the way up through every war, hurricane, flood, battles, everything, depression, war, right here, all of that. Revolutionary War, which state had more battles fought in it than any other state? South Carolina. We're about 200. Nobody else even comes close. And a lot of the historians said this is where it was won. This is where the British came and they gave up. So they went on back up and the fight was gone and that was the end of the war. That's that story. A lot of times we don't realize what we've done in this country. But I think uh, it's, it's time to stand up. It's time to realize that we're in a position to be leaders. It's time to give the rest of the country a model to look up to. As some of the cabinet members and President Trump's cabinet had told me is that South Carolina is a model and we are watching you and I what I hope is that when I get through doing what I'm trying to do that I that the people of South Carolina will be as proud of, of Peggy and me as I we are of the people of South Carolina but let's say this this is such a great state we're making so much progress things are going our way we have some things we need to do but it's coming South Carolina is coming. Everybody wants some of South Carolina. And speaking for myself, in the words of that great philosopher, Tim McGraw, also known as a country western singer, I like it, I love it, I want some more of it, <laughs> and I'm glad to be here speaking for Peggy and me. We're honored to be here with you. That's all I know. I'd be glad to, if you, if you have time, I'd be glad to try to answer questions for you. Okay then. Yes, ma'am. The legislature has done a good thing 
by giving the governor the authority to remove members of the uh, Department of Transportation on, on the, the, the Transportation Commission. Uh, I wish I had the authority to appoint them, but I don't, but I can remove them. And I hope that's not a power that I have to exercise. What I intend to do is to see that every dollar that is brought into the department or to the state infrastructure bank I've appointed a new man to head the infrastructure bank. He's John White from Spartanburg. You may know him, a respected family. Everybody's been to the Beacon, I think, at one time or another. That's his father. And all those four boys worked at the Beacon all the way through college at, at, uh, at Walford. But, and uh, appointed a new interim man until I can get him confirmed, Tony Cox from Myrtle Beach, uh, onto, the, onto the board. What I intend to do is see that the money that comes in there is spent on the priority items as established by Christy Hall, who does a magnificent job, and the professionals at the highway department. What has happened in, in past years, and one reason we don't have the money that we needed to fix the roads is because the money was diverted to other things. Now that's, that's just gonna stop with me. If, if I've got the power to do it, I'm gonna stop it. And if I have to, if people do, do not, follow that very simple rule, which I know is what everybody wants, and I'll remove them and put somebody else in there. I'll let the legislature, the delegation, give me someone else to put in. If they don't do any better, I'll remove them too. But it, it's time to have some patriots in these offices, some people who are interested only in, uh, and not just their section. People, we have people from around the state, so they will have knowledge of what's going on in their section. But the goal ought to be to follow the priorities that benefit the state. And that means you got to fix the old roads that are heavily traveled before you start building new ones. And you don't build these roads that are not priority roads. Uh, we got brand new roads in some places that got very little traffic on it while we have roads that are crying for, for some fixing that uh, are getting no attention. I, I intend to change that. I hope that answers that. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you for what you did with Planned Parenthood. I appreciate yes. that. Can you bring us up to date on, on where that is and uh, where it's going? And, and can you suggest what we might do to help? Yes. <clears throat> what I've asked is all of the agencies that report to me to analyze their procedures and the laws and to see if there's any money that's coming through the state that is going to uh, pay for abortions. And if there, if there is, we will cut it off to the extent that the law allows, and I believe the law will allow us to do that. I don't have that report back yet. You'll understand these are some of these laws and procedures, particularly when they're overlaid with the federal, same from the federal government. It's a labyrinth. It's real hard to figure out what money is going to where. And it gets commingled and all that. And uh, But we're trying to straighten that out. And what you can do, if you have insight in it, Tell it to him, or, or, or tell it to tell it, tell it to the, these men here. Tell it to Hamilton. Tell it to him. Tell it to Gary Smith, and tell them to tell me, and we'll go from there. Even tell it to Bannister. <laughs> He'll do it. Who's next? Questions? Okay. We all. This is a great pleasure for us to be here, and we look forward to coming back. I don't think I told y'all that Peggy's from Spartanburg. Did y'all know that? I picked out myself too. Right there. <laughs> Thank you very much.